All right, so this presentation is part of the AP Calculus, AP Daily Calculus video series. And in this video, I'm going to discuss a specific concept associated with the AP Calculus curriculum, namely the definite integral as an accumulation function. So my name is Steve Kokoska. I'm a recently retired professor at Bloomsburg University in Pennsylvania, and I'm a former AP Calculus chief reader. So I'm gonna stop my video and I'm gonna position my screen so that I can write on it a little bit easier and we'll go to slide two. So here's a quick outline of the information that I'm gonna present in this video. I'm gonna start by reviewing the most important idea in an AP calculus course, the fundamental theorem of calculus. And then I'm gonna consider at least one alternate interpretation of this theorem. I'm gonna look at several problems and at least one of these will be calculator active. So as a prelude, I think that there are two very important AP calculus concepts that are often tested and that are associated with the fundamental theorem of calculus. And they are the definite integral as an accumulation function and what I call the net change theorem. So let's start with the FTC. So here's a statement of this in this box. It says, suppose F is a continuous function on the interval A to B. If G of X is defined in this manner here, if G of X is defined that way as an integral from A to X of F of T dt, then G prime of X is equal to F of X. And the second part of this says the definite integral from a to b of little f of x dx is equal to capital F of b minus capital F of a, where capital F is any antiderivative, any antiderivative of little f. So this is the unifying theorem in calculus that connects the two most important operations, differentiation and integration. So let's take a closer look at the fundamental theorem of calculus before we move on. So first, this function g that's defined in the FTC depends only on the variable x, which is the upper limit in the integral. So if x is a fixed number, then the definite integral is a definite number. However, if x is allowed to vary, then the definite integral of course varies and it defines a function of x, which we denote by g of x. Now in note two here, if f happens to be a positive function, then g of x can be interpreted as the area under the graph of f from a to x, where x is in the interval a to b. So in my mind, anyway, this function g is accumulating the area under the graph of f from a to x. So it is this blue shaded region in here, g of x is represented by that blue shaded region. Now, note that if f is continuous on the interval a to b and, and takes on both positive and negative values, then the function g can be interpreted, at least in my mind, as a net area so far function. Now, down here in note three, the fundamental theorem of calculus part two provides a much simpler method for evaluating a definite integral. And really it says all we need to do is to find n antiderivative capital F of little f. And then in order to find this definite integral, in order to evaluate that, we just take capital F of B minus capital F of A. Now, if we didn't have this result, then we'd have to resort to evaluating definite integrals using the definition involving the limit of a Riemann sum. And if you've solved any of these problems, you know that even some of the simpler integrands result in some pretty painful algebra and usually we have to use some clever summation and limit properties to get an answer. So the FTC is really helpful. Now, here's another way to think about 
the result from the fundamental theorem of calculus part two. You know that the derivative capital F prime represents the rate of change of y equal f of x with respect to x. I know you've studied that and I know you know that. And you also know that this difference, capital F of b minus capital F of a, that represents the change in y as x changes from a to b. But remember that y could, think for example on a graph, y could for example increase and then decrease and then increase again. So this difference really represents the net change in y. So if we use this last interpretation, then the fundamental theorem of calculus part two can be restated in terms of net change. And this is often called a net change theorem. A lot of people call this, a lot of books use this phrase. So this says that the definite integral of a rate of change f prime is the net change in the original function f. So that is looking at this equation, the definite integral from a to b of f prime of x dx is f of b minus f of a. Cool. Well, okay, here's still another in way to interpret the fundamental theorem of calculus part two. And, you know, as an aside, I, I think that this equation is used or tested repeatedly on the AP calculus exam. So this is a good one to know. The definite integral a to b of f prime of x dx represents an accumulation of change in f over the interval a to b. So if we rearrange the terms in the net change theorem from the previous slide, we get an alternate interpretation and a very practical approach in my mind for solving problems. It says that capital F of b is equal to capital F of a plus this definite integral. It says that the end amount is equal to the start amount plus the net change. So this is a very logical, very reasonable, and an extremely useful approach to solving AP calculus type problems. So wow, after all of that, finally, let's try to use these concepts to solve a variety of problems. So my example one is about net area so far. I think this is a cool one. This is kind of a typical AP calculus problem. Let's suppose that little f is a function whose graph is given in this figure. It consists of, let's see, I think I've got it, three line, three straight line segments and a quarter circle. I think you can see that quarter circle down here. And in addition, the function g is defined to be the definite integral from 0 to x of f of t dt. So that should look familiar, I hope. In part a, I'd like to find all these values of g, holy Toledo. And in part b, I'd kind of like to put all of this together, get a rough sketch of the graph of g, and try to take a look at the relationship between g and f. Okay, let's see if we can do this. So, all right, we know the G of X is the net area. We know that this is the net area of the region bounded by the graph of F and the X axis over the interval zero to X. Now, we know that F is both positive and negative over this interval zero to eight. So G is really the net area so far function. That means it's the net area of the region bounded by the graph of f and the x-axis over the interval zero to x. So let's try to find these values of g. And the way that I'm going to do this is I'm going to use some geometry here and some area arguments to find these values. Okay, so the first one is really easy. Here I am right here on the screen. G of zero is just this definite integral from zero to zero of f of t dt. I don't need to look at any area argument at all. That's just equal to zero using the properties of definite integrals. No need to consider any sort of area argument. Let's take a look at G of one. Well, G of one is by the definition of this function G, this definite integral. 
And let's see here. It is the area of this blue shaded region in my figure down in the lower left. And let's see here. That's the area. What is that? That's a triangle on top of a square, I guess. Or, okay, if you want to be a little fancy, it's a trapezoid. But I'll find the area of that region by taking a look at the area of the square, which is just one, and the area of the triangle. That's one half the base times the height. There it is. So one half the base, which is one, the height, which is one. And so g of one I've got is three halves. That's pretty cool. I kind of like this problem because you can visualize the results. I understand what's going on in the background and I can visualize this one. Let's take a look at g of two. g of two is by definition this definite integral. It is here the area of this blue shaded region. And I'm gonna make use of another property of definite integrals here. I'm really gonna write this, this definite integral as the definite integral from zero to one of f of t dt plus the integral of one to two of f of t dt. And the reason that I'm gonna do that is because I know that area is additive. So I just need to add to three halves the area of this additional region over here from one to two. So again, area is additive. And oh, by the way, this additional area, excuse me, is above the x-axis. So g of 2 is just 3 halves plus the area of a rectangle or 2 squares. So g of 2, I think, is just 7 halves. So by the way, notice that as x increases, g is accumulating area, or more generally, net area. All right, let's continue here. Let's see if we can find some more values of G. G of three is the area of this shaded region. I'm gonna take the area of this region, which I have already is seven half. I'm gonna add the area of this shaded region, which again is the area of a square and a triangle or a trapezoid. So I did that up here. I've got G of three, whoops, I'm sorry about that. G of three is now five, pretty straightforward. G of four is the area of this entire blue shaded region, the area up to here, plus the area of a little triangle in there. There it is. And I got an 11 halves. Pretty easy. I think you're getting the hang of this. Here's where things get a little interesting on the next page. Let's see if we can find G of five. Well, G of five is G of four. That's this shaded region plus the net area under the graph of f from four to five. Now, f is negative from four to five. And therefore, I've shaded this region in green to let me know that I have to find that area and I have to subtract it off because again, f is below the x-axis. So g of five is g of, four, 11 halves, minus the area of that triangle, which is one half. So son of a gun, g of five is five. g of six, I'll continue in this, in this way, is just g of five, and I have to subtract off the area of that green shaded region. So let's see, I think I got five minus the area of that region, I got a seven halves. Beautiful. Pretty cool that we can compute the values of G, a net area so far function using geometry, and we can visualize our results. All right, let's see what happens with G of seven. G of seven is the net accumulated area from zero to seven. It's the net area of the blue shaded region minus the area of the green shaded region. Or again, easier, I'm gonna take G of six and I'm gonna subtract off this region right in here, the area of that region in here. Now, that plain region isn't a nice geometric figure. It's not a rectangle, it's not a triangle, son of a gun, it's not even a trapezoid. And the reason for that is because I've got a curve as one of the boundaries of that plain region. So what I'm gonna do for now is I'm just gonna estimate that area as the best I can. So I think I have roughly the area of a square right there, one, and I'm gonna estimate the area of this reg region as about a 0.9. So I'm gonna take seven halves, 
which is what g of six is, and I'm gonna subtract off one, and I'm gonna subtract off a 0.9, and I got roughly a point, a 1.6 for g of seven. Pretty cool. Oh, one more, bear with me here. G of eight is the net area so far from zero to eight. It's the area of the blue shaded region minus the area of the green shaded region. And I'm gonna cheat a little bit here. Uh, because the region bounded by the graph of F in the x-axis between six and eight, so I'm looking in here, I can see that that's a quarter circle, an exact quarter circle. I'm going to find G of eight by taking G of six, and I'm going to subtract off the area of that quarter circle, which I think is one quarter pi R squared, one quarter pi two squared. And so G of eight is seven halves minus pi. Wow, that's probably a little overkill, but it makes my graph on the next pages here really nice. So in part B, we're asked to produce a rough sketch of the graph of G. So here, what I've done in this graph right here is I have plotted the points found in part A, and I've connected them with a smooth curve. And note once again that as X increases, G represents the accumulated net area. And notice that as we reached, whoops, I'm sorry about that. Notice that as we reached X equal four, we crossed over X equal four, F turned negative. So we had to subtract off the area, the area below the X axis. Now, I'm going to give you a couple of things to think about down here at the bottom. Can you describe the relationship between these two functions, f and, f and g? Can you describe the relationship between the two graphs? If I superimpose or if I put both the graph of f and the graph of g on the same coordinate axes. Now, I'm going to leave those as kind of open questions for you to answer and to justify. Now, before I leave this problem, I wanted to show you what I think is a very nice use of technology to confirm my results. I'm using the TI-84CE on the screen. And on a TI-84CE, I can define a piecewise function. And I think what I can do is describe or use at least, or pardon me, at most five pieces. But I think I'm OK here because I had four pieces. So I'm looking up here at my definition of my calculator variable, calculator function y1. Now, I know you can't see all four pieces in this screenshot. But I took some time to define the three lines and the equation of a circle. And I defined them over the appropriate intervals. And by the way, this is a really good exercise for AP students. My experience suggests that recognition and understanding of piecewise functions is often a weak spot on the AP calculus exam. In my calculator variable y2, so right here, in my calculator variable y2, I defined the function g, the net area so far function. Now, I don't like the use of the variable x here as both an upper bound and the variable integration. And I'd never write that mathematically on a piece of paper or in a pencil. I'd never use the same variable there. But that's the calculator syntax that I need to use here. So over here in the top right hand side, here's a graph of my function, my calculator function y1. And it sure looks like I defined it correctly. It looks like I wrote all the pieces correctly analytically. It looks like the function that I gave you in the very beginning. Now, I can find values of g on the graph screen by using the integration function. And I did that down here. I just found the integral of f of x from 0 to 6. And you'll notice I got that 3.5. And it actually colors shades in this region. Now, I have a nice visualization. I don't have two different colors. And that's OK. This still conveys this concept of accumulation. And finally, I think this is really cool to find all the values of G that I need. Over here, I created a table of values. 
the first column has my x values and the column labeled y2 right here i have the values of g, of g and you know what this confirms my analytical results and that's really cool i like to use technology to explore a solution to a problem i like to con it or take a look at it and solve it analytically. And then I like to go back to technology to confirm my analytical results. Well, we really beat that problem into the ground. Let's take a look at another one. Here's example two. Let's try another example. Left side F, I, oh, by the way, I think this is a very typical AP calculus problem involving the analysis of function. That's been the bread and butter AP calculus sort of question for a long, long time. Here's the graph of its derivative uh, using the graph of a derivative and an accumulation. So let's let f be a function defined on this closed interval minus four to six. Let's suppose that f of zero is equal to one. So I have sort of an initial condition. And the graph of the derivative, now be careful, is given in this figure. It consists of three straight line segments and this time a semicircle. Now, there are several questions associated with this graph and added information about the function f. And I won't read through each of these, but I'm gonna to try to solve each of these questions with you. So in part A, we need to find all the values of f at which f, f has a relative minimum, all the values of x for which f has a relative minimum. Now, in general, the way that I would solve this problem is I need to find all the critical values or critical points those values of x of which the derivative is zero, what does not exist. So in a traditional analytical problem, where we're given an expression for f in terms of x, I'd start by taking the derivative. Now, here we're given the graph of the derivative. And I, I've just reproduced this graph because I might do a little scribbling here. So we simply need to examine the graph for places where the derivative is zero or it does not exist. And I think I've got three places on this graph where the derivative is zero. I've got x equal, oops, sorry about that. I've got x equal minus two right there. I've got x equal plus two, and I've got an x equal five. Those are places where the derivative is zero. Now, there are no places on the graph where the derivative does not exist. That sounds kind of funny, but f prime of x dne, there are none. Now, a common error here is to look at this graph of f prime and say, well, wait a minute, there are some sharp edges or corners there. And doesn't that mean that the derivative does not exist? Well, you're right, but that would be the derivative of f prime that does not exist at those places. f prime exists everywhere on the given interval. Now, in a traditional analytical problem, once I've got these critical values, I might consider a sign chart. Now, just a reminder that sign charts are not sufficient justification on the AP calculus exam. Now you can certainly use them and I encourage that and I use them in my class, but you must complete your justification by including an interpretation of your sign chart. Now here from the graph, we can see that f prime changes from negative to positive at minus two and at x equal five. So therefore the function has a relative minimum at x equal minus two and five. The function is changing from decreasing to increasing at those two values. Very typical sort of a question, part B. In part B, we need to find all the values of x at which the graph of f has a point of inflection. And once again, we need to use what's given to us here. We need, we need to use the graph of f prime to answer this question. Now, I apologize, I may go a little off, off base here a little bit, but I want you to understand how I'm getting the answer here. So I'm gonna remind you about what it means to have a point of inflection on the graph of f. It is an inflection point if f is continuous there and the graph changes from concave up to concave down or concave down to concave up. Now, traditionally we have a concavity test that says if f double prime of x is greater than zero for all x in an interval i, 
than f is concave up on that interval. And similarly, if f double prime of x is less than zero for all x in an interval, then f is concave down on that interval. So we can determine that there is a point of inflection at any value in the domain of f where the second derivative changes sign. And again, we could use a sign chart to help us toward a complete justification. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to reinterpret that concavity test so that we can find the points of inflection using this graph of f prime. If f prime is increasing, then its derivative f double prime is greater than zero. And if f prime is decreasing, then its derivative is less than zero. So a point of inflection is any value in the domain of f where the first derivative changes from increasing to decreasing or vice versa. So finally, I'm going to put all this together. If I look at this graph of f prime, I can see right here at x equals zero, f prime changes from increasing to decreasing. And then at x equals four, f prime changes from decreasing to increasing. So given my argument, the graph of f has points of inflection where x is equal to zero and where x is equal to four. Cool. In part C, we need to find the intervals on which the graph of f is concave up and increasing. Again, another typical sort of an AP calculus exam question. Well, f is increasing where f prime is greater than zero. Let's see, those would be on the intervals minus two to two. Yeah, I see that. And from five to six, good, I got that. And f is concave up where f double prime is greater than zero or where f prime is increasing. So that occurs, let's see, from minus four to zero. Yep, I can see that. And from four to six. So that means f is concave up and increasing on these intervals, minus two to zero and five to six. Very cool. And I answered that question from the given information from the graph of f prime. And finally, in part D, let's find the absolute minimum value of f of x over the closed interval minus four to six. Okay, since f prime exists, f prime, f is differentiable and therefore continuous. So that means I can use the table of values method or what many of us call the candidates test. So that means I need to find the values of f at all the critical numbers in the interval minus four to six and at the endpoints of the interval. And the smallest of these values is the absolute minimum value. Well, let's see, we already know that the critical values are at minus two, two and five. Now I'm gonna throw out x equal two. And the reason is because f prime changes from positive to negative there. So that means that f has a relative maximum at x equal two. So I don't need to worry about that one. I'm looking for the absolute minimum value. So that leaves these four values to check. Now, I think this is the most straightforward way to do this on an AP calculus exam. I'm gonna create a table of values and I won't go through this with you in gory detail, but here's what I did. I found the value of f at each one of these values quickly f of minus two is equal to f of zero plus the definite integral. So this is an example of this net change theorem. And I'm finding these definite integrals. I'm finding those by geometry, by looking at the area underneath that curve. And I found all of these values. And what I did is I added a little bit extra here. I converted all of these into a numerical value. And the reason is because it might be a little bit difficult for me to look at the analytical answers, the symbolic answers, and know which one of these is actually the smaller. So I looked at the numerical values and I found the smallest one was right there, minus 1.858. 
So among these uh, four values, the smallest is pi minus five, and that's the absolute minimum of that function f on the interval minus four to six. Good. I've got one more here that I'd like to take a look at. One more example I'd like to try, and this involves an applied problem or I guess an AP calculus lingo, a contextual problem, and it's calculator active. So in this problem, wheat is flowing into a silo at a rate, be careful, this is a rate function given by the function capital R. So that's this function right here. And it's flowing out of the silo into grain trucks at a rate modeled by this function G. Let's see, where is it? Here it is right here. And I know that there are 10 cubic meters of grain in the silo at time t equals zero. So I've got several questions here associated with this background information. And let's see if we can solve these. In part A, we need to find the amount of wheat that flows into the silo during the four hour period from zero to four. Well, look, we have the rate at which wheat is, that's hard to say, at which wheat is flowing into the silo, and that's our function r. So all we need to do is to accumulate the amount of wheat flowing into the silo over that time period, over that time period, zero to four. So darn it, this is just the definite integral from zero to four of capital R of t dt. Now, just a couple of little things here. You'll notice that I wrote the actual expression for R of t in here, but that's not necessary on an AP calculus exam. And in fact, I would recommend that you don't do that. R of t is defined in the statement of the problems, and so darn it, I can simply use that symbol R. If you try to write this actual expression, there's always a chance that you would make a mistake in copying down that expression. So my advice is to use this symbol and not even write this on your AP calculus exam. Now look, in addition, this is a calculator active problem. So there's no need here to try to find a symbolic antiderivative. And in fact, I don't think you can here. So all I need to do is to write the mathematical setup and go directly to my calculator and get an answer. Now, here are two calculator screenshots just to show you how I obtained my answer. I input my expression for R and my calculator variable Y1. And I was looking ahead just a little bit, okay, so bear with me, I also entered in the other rate function, the rate at which wheat was flowing out of the silo, my function g and y2. And in this screen right here, I simply evaluated that definite integral zero to four. I have, I think my mode set for three digits to the right of the decimal. That's uh, the way we usually do it in AP calculus. And so there's my 30.954, very good. Oh, and here's kind of a nice visualization of part A to sort of tie things together with what I talked about at the beginning of this presentation. This is a graph of R and the shaded region represents the definite integral from zero to four of R of T dt. So this is an additional confirmation of that definite integral 30.954. And again, a visualization of what's going on. So in part B, I need to determine if the amount of wheat flowing into the silo is increasing or decreasing at time t equal eight hours. Well, to answer this question, we need to consider the difference in rates at time t equal eight. We need to look at r of eight minus g of eight. So using technology down here, I apologize, I'm gonna sneak down and look at this screenshot. I found that difference to be roughly minus 5.680. The important point here, I think, or the justification is that this difference, I note that this difference is less than zero. This means that R of eight is less than G of eight. So that means that the rate flowing in is less than the rate flowing out. And therefore I conclude that the amount of wheat flowing into the silo is decreasing at time T equal eight hours. 
And finally, in part C, we need to find the time at which the amount of wheat in the silo is a maximum. Look, there are several ways to approach this problem, and I do this one in a kind of a straightforward, maybe a little long-winded way, but in a way for me that's very clear to understand and that shows the concepts needed to solve this problem. So the way that I attack this problem is I start by defining a function A, which represents the amount of wheat in the silo at time t for t between 0 and 12. And again, this ties together this idea of net change. A of t here is the initial amount in the silo at time t equals 0 plus the net change in wheat at the silo. That's kind of cool. This clearly shows the concepts, in my opinion, needed to solve this problem, and it ties together this idea of net change. So to find the absolute maximum amount, the maximum value, excuse me, of this function A, I need to evaluate A at the endpoints of the closed interval, 0 to 12, and the critical points. So darn it, that means I need to find the derivative of A. Well, here's the derivative A, and then some cool stuff going on in the background here. The derivative of a constant 10 is 0. And the derivative of this expression is just R of t minus G of t. That's an application of the fundamental theorem of calculus. Now, I need to use technology to solve this expression to find the critical points. So here's a graph down here in the screenshot of R of t and G of t between 0 and 12. And it looks like there are two points of intersection, one there and one there. Now, it might look like there's another one over there at t equals 12, but you're going to have to trust me on this one. If you zoom in there and evaluate, or even evaluate the functions at t equals 12, you see that they don't intersect there. So there are two critical points that I need to find. Now, there are a couple of ways to do this. And here, what I did is I gave you those two different ways. Excuse me, one way to do this is to find a point of intersection on the graph screen. But I also find the same, found the same value of t using the numerical solve feature of the graphing calculator on the home screen. Now, I'm not sure why, but I tend to explore on the graph screen and confirm my results on the home screen. Now, I understand that under the pressure of a high stakes exam, under the time constraints, you might not have time to do that. So in either case, you must store the value of t that you find in a calculator variable. So I stored this value of t right here in a calculator variable that I called a. So remember that you must store intermediate values to the greatest degree of accuracy allowed by technology, allowed by your calculator. So I did the same thing down here. I found the other point of intersection. I stored that in my calculator variable B again. Here I did it on the graph screen and over here on this screen, I did it on the home screen using the numerical solve feature. All right, I'm going to put this all together. I need to evaluate A. Let's see. At the values, let's see, I need to evaluate A at the endpoints, 0 and 12. I need to evaluate A at these two values where R and G intersect, my calculator variables A and B. Here's how I defined my functions. Here's R, here's G, here's my function capital A of T. And over here, I created a table of values. Let's see, there's t equals 0, there's t equal 12. Here are my two critical points. And all I need to do is to look at those four values and pick out the largest value. And there it is, 24.71. And therefore, the amount of wheat in the silo is a maximum at t equals 6.425 hours. That's a really nice problem, in my opinion. Well, that's all the examples I have. I'm going to flip this up a little bit here. I'm going to try to come back to my video and see if this works. There we go. How about that? And one last screen I think I have. There we go. I just wanted you to know that throughout this presentation, I use TI Inspire and TI-84 plus screenshots with permission from Texas Instruments.
So I hope this video provides a little bit of insight into the definite integral as an accumulation function. I hope I've given you a few AP calculus type problems and I've shown you the use of technology to solve some of these types of problems in context and best wishes as you prepare for the next AP calculus exam.